Hey, okay, so we're going to pick up where we left off in the last short lecture by talking uh, some more about ideology uh, and, and then move into uh, the idea of corporate uh, colonization and resistance. So despite everything I just told you, uh, or told you in the last lecture, about how pernicious ideology can be and how, how pervasive it is, right, and how it, how it, how it, it, it does all these things to us, right, it operates on us in ways that are, that are hard to even understand, it's still important to recognize that it's more delicate than, than we think. So ideology is about maintaining the status quo, about keeping the people in charge in charge, but yet we need to realize that change still is never far away. And, and we see this through, through a whole bunch of examples, right? So we were talking in the last lecture about how we missed out on women's contributions to science and, and the academy and, and industry and the business world and so on, and, and how ideology prevented us from recognizing that, of course, women could go to work, right? Um, so, so here we see examples of, of how that ideology crumbles. So there's women's suffrage, right? Women's right to vote. Uh, the civil rights movement is, is another example of how ideology changes. The, the Me Too movement that's, that's recently uh, developed over the past few years. Uh, feminism, right? There's, there's all these movements that are, that are challenging uh, the, the existing ideology in important ways, I suggest to you, right? Um, and, and so ideology... Uh, helps maintain hegemony. And you remember, hegemony is power, but hegemony is power that's maintained in two ways, right? Not just through through coercion, not just through violence at the end of a gun, but also through ideology, right? Through getting people to believe what you want them to believe. And and so so ideology, that, that status, right? That, that hegemonic status of power is, is has to be constantly negotiated. And it's delicate. It can be lost. Right? The people in charge can, can lose their power. And so as a result, we, we understand power is constantly contested and negotiated. People are always challenging power. It's, it's, the challenges to power are unending. Right? I, I mean, that's why, I, arguably, that's why great nations rise and fall. Right? Because their power is constantly contested and constantly challenged. And so, I don't want you to think that ideology is uh, uh, this this force that can't be challenged, because it is challenged and it's challenged constantly. It's just a very powerful force that's tough to undo. So again, we, we, we need we need to be careful about what we consider to be challenges to the status quo. And the reason I say this it goes back to to Zinn in this quote, right? The idea that 1% of the nation owns a third of the wealth and the rest of the wealth is distributed in such a way that the other 99% of people are turned against one another. Right? So, so then what I would say, if you are a revolutionary, if you are a young person who wants to challenge uh, the hegemony of the ruling class, right, you have to be careful about which things you're challenging. Right? What are you fighting about? Make sure that you're not fighting the other 99% right and that you're truly challenging power right because the truth is that the guy that's a misogynist or a sexist who's who works with you and treats you bad cuz you're a woman right the, the the truth is is that person is part of the 99% too and that's not really where the problem lies i might argue right i mean clearly they're doing something that's wrong but but changing their behavior doesn't change the power structure, right? They don't hold power. Just because somebody says something that makes you uh, pissed off doesn't mean that, that they're the power holder in the equation, right? And, and so, you know, we can challenge the status quo, but the question becomes, are you challenging it effectively in order to, to actually generate change, if that's what you're interested in, right? A lot of people aren't interested in challenging the power structure at all. They'd like to become part of that power structure. So, you know, these are important questions and important things to consider. So, uh, scholars in, in critical organ, organizational communication, what we're trying to do here and what I'm trying to teach you about here, they're interested in, in studying organization as sites of power and resistance. Who has the power? Who's resisting the power? How is the, the, con the contestation of power negotiated? 
right, how does this work? And, and so this all goes back to things like the, the Ludlow Massacre and the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire that we learned about earlier in the semester, right? Those are really uh, blatant examples of, of, of power, right? And, and, and power that needed to be contested and challenged, right? The status quo was not good for workers in such a way that they were being murdered. And that's about as not good as you can get, right? So, so those are the kinds of things that, that people in ORCOM study, in critical ORCOM. So they examine the ways organizations seek to control and shape the behavior of their employees, as well as the various means by which employees attempt to resist and escape these methods of control. And again, this is all related to the notion of hegemony. This, this goes back to the Italian scholar uh, and revolutionary Antonio Gramsci. Uh, and, and hegemony is not just about force, it's also about what we call the manufacture of consensus and the process of naturalization. So a classic example of this, right? Uh, it's, it seems natural to ask, why don't our employees work harder, right? I, I mean, that's the sort of question that you hear all the time. People ask management consultants and so on, right? Uh, but the real question, the, the more reasonable question, honestly, probably is, why do our employees work as hard as they do? Why do they work at all, right? And when you begin to think about it in these ways, when you begin to, to, to turn these equations on their head, it, it really gives you some insight. It makes you think, right? So hegemony is maintained through ideology, which functions in large part through worker job employer identification. So people go to work for the organization, or you go to the school and you're a Gordon State Highlander. Maybe that's a bad example because school spirit here really isn't that crazy. But maybe you go, you're a Nittany Lion because you go to Penn State, or you're a Bulldog because of Georgia, right? Uh, and you go there, and it's 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 built into you, and you're so proud of it. It's it's who you are, and you don't question the power structure. You don't question whether or not your professors should be teaching or the administration should be administering, right? Because it's so ingrained in you. The ideology has naturalized things to the point where you're just damn glad to be part of it, right? So, along with this, or in keeping with this idea, is the notion of corporate colonization. And so one of the big scholars behind this is a fellow by the name of Stan Dietz. And, and Dietz has said that corporations have become the primary institutions in modern life. That they've uh, surpassed religion, family, and community institutions in terms of the production of meaning and identity in culture. Right? This goes back to the idea that when you meet somebody for the first time, you ask them, hey, what do you do? Where do you work? Right? Um, it, it shows you how, how, in our society today, how tightly what you do is uh, bound up with, with the rest of your idea of self and who you are, right? Like, uh, well, a young girl just asked me the other day at the gym, uh, you know, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I'm a college professor, right? And she's like, oh, you don't seem like a college professor. Now, I don't know what the fuck that meant, but... Um, you know, it's like, and, and actually, I had to think about it for a minute. Like, I was like, no, oh, I don't know what that means, right? Like, what did she mean by that? And that's because the idea of being a college professor is is part of. It's tied up in my idea of who I am, right? So this this notion that that work has invaded our lives and our sense of identity. This is known as corporate colonization, right? It's the idea, just as uh, you know, European countries used to colonize uh, other countries. Uh, the idea is that work has invaded your life and has colonized you, right? <coughs> so it, it's colonized your beliefs, your values, and your meanings. An example of this would be uh, the idea of school is training to get a job, right? So, so many of you, you know, when I ask students, why are you here? No one has ever answered, well, to learn. <laughs> no one literally has ever said that to me when I ask my students why they're in school. And you're not really here to learn many of you you're here to get a job to get a piece of paper so that you can get a job and serve a corporation which is crazy right because the original idea of education was just learning for learning's sake and instead what you're doing is you're getting education as product as prepackaged knowledge right i mean it's like going to the, the walgreens and buying a disposable razor right it's 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 the same thing so, uh, along with this is the ideas that come from Gideon Kunda, uh, who did a high-tech firm study, 
right? Um, and, and, and he studied what we call the engineering of culture. And so what he found was, uh, what Gideon found was that under normative control or under normal control, members act in the best interest of the company, not only because they're physically coerced, right? Like you have to be here at a certain point in time and you have to be here at your desk, right? Uh, and not purely from an instrumental concern with economic rewards, so not just because they're getting paid, but because they're driven by internal commitment and a strong identification with company goals and the intrinsic satisfaction from work. So what, what couldn't have found then was that ideology is working, right? There, it's... It, people are driven by an internal commitment to their job even more so than they are through any kind of instrumental uh, concern or uh, concern with getting paid, etc. Now, uh, related to this idea of corporate colonization is the idea that corporate cultures are, are built using something that we call strategic ambiguity. And strategic ambiguity is uh, when uh, businesses and organizations have things like mission statements that say things uh, that are purposefully ambiguous, that are, that are hard, that, that can mean almost anything and are written that way on purpose. So, for example, you know, one of the things we're supposed to do at Gordon is create ethical leaders, right? Um, <laughs> so one of the things we're supposed to be doing at Gordon is, is making ethical leaders, right? And, and so uh, no one would argue with that. Who's going to come and say, oh, I don't want my leaders to be ethical? But it, it's an ambiguous phrase. It doesn't mean anything. Right? In ethical in what way? Right? Um, so uh, we also find with corporate colonization that, that people in professional jobs uh, are, are uh, potentially more at risk of burnout. Um, they're, they're, they're also being subjected to increasing levels of control by organizations. Uh, you know, so usually we think about blue collar workers, factory workers, and, and uh, people like people who work with their hands and so on as being uh, controlled by, by the places that they work. When the truth is now that white collar workers are, are even more controlled by the places where they work uh, because blue collar workers can leave their work behind at five o'clock and white collar workers uh, oftentimes take it home with them. All right, well, that's it for this lecture. Thanks for checking it out.